Hello, everyone, and welcome to our podcast series in classical political economy by the Vincent Center for the Public Understanding of Economics and Entrepreneurship at the University of Buckingham. The Vincent Center runs a series of programs in economics and related fields designed to promote a wider understanding of classical liberal economics and how markets, trade, and entrepreneurship promote welfare in a free society. I'm Dr. Juan Castaneda, director of the Vincent Center, and today we'll be hosting John Greenwood. John Greenwood works for International Monetary Monitor and until 2021 was chief economist of Invesco, with responsibility for providing economic analysis and forecasts to Invesco portfolio managers and clients. As editor of Asian Monetary Monitor in 1983, he proposed a currency board scheme for stabilizing the Hong Kong dollar that is still in operation today. In the 1990s, he was a director of the Hong Kong Future Exchange Clearing Corporation, a council member of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, and an economic advisor to the Hong Kong government. In 1998, John joined Invesco and became a member of the Committee on Currency Board Operations of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. John holds an MA and an honorary PhD from the University of Edinburgh. He is also a fellow of the Institute for Applied Economics, Global Health, and the study of business enterprise at Johns Hopkins University. Today, we will discuss uh, with John his recent contribution to the Journal of Economic Affairs with the title, The Monetary Policy Strategy of the Bank of England in 2020 and 2021, an assessment, published in February 2023. You will find more details on uh, John's article in the description section of this podcast. John, it is a pleasure to, to have you uh, uh, with us. Your article couldn't be more timely. Uh, in the context of the current inflationary episode in the UK. We hear very different narratives of the cause of inflation. It is as if uh, policymakers, leading policy commentators, and indeed also very senior academics, didn't have a clear theory of inflation. We very much need to understand how we got here, and in particular, the role played by the Bank of England's policies in 2020 and also in 2021, and how we can avoid a similar episode in the future. Let me start by quoting the abstract of your article that I think is very, very revealing. Excessive money creation during the COVID pandemic has resulted in Britain's worst episode of inflation since 1990 and 1991. The backdrop to this failure of monetary policy is the Bank of England's aggregate demand, aggregate supply framework together with the Monetary Policy Committee's neglect of broad money. An alternative way to operate monetary policy is urgently needed. A significantly improved monetary policy outcome could be achieved by shifting from trying to steer the economy using interest rates and quantitative easing or quantitative tightening to reliance on the relative stability of income velocity, the ratio of nominal GDP to broad money, as a means of managing aggregate demand. Well done. <laughs> Can you briefly summarize the current monetary policy strategy of the Bank of England? In a nutshell, how, how uh, uh, does the Bank of England make a policy decision? Right. So the Bank of England has this framework of aggregate demand, aggregate supply. And if you read back through their publications, their quarterly monetary policy reports, they used to be called inflation reports. Um, you'll find usually a chapter on aggregate demand, a chapter on aggregate supply. So what the staff of the bank do is to prepare estimates of aggregate demand, normally built up from the spending side, that is consumption, investment, government spending, uh, and the external account. <clears throat> and it uses that kind of analysis, plus a, a number of models, to predict the components of that. So they have an idea of kind of what's going to happen to total spending. On the other side, uh, they also have this notion of aggregate supply, which is composed of two elements mainly. That is potential output, which they measure by means of something called the output gap, the, the gap between actual output and what is calculated to be the potential output. And if um, potential output is uh, above current output, then they might stimulate the economy to achieve the potential output, and conversely. Um, and the other part of aggregate supply that we hear most about 
concerns the labor market. Um, they make a judgment on whether the labor market is very tight or very, you know, very easy, um, and whether it's going to contribute to inflation. The key point, I suppose, is that if aggregate demand exceeds aggregate supply by a significant margin in their view, uh, then uh, that they would uh, tighten policy, they, they would raise rates. But it's very difficult to quantify any of the, these notions, uh, let alone in real time. So these things are, or that general framework is supplemented by things like um, monetary and financial conditions indicators which have become very popular with senior bank staff. Um, but in my judgment, don't contribute a lot to understanding uh, the background or the, uh, the potential for inflation. And inflation after all, or achieving the inflation target of 2% is after all the mandate. So that should really come first. Um, basically the bank is taking a very indirect approach and as we've seen in this recent COVID crisis, uh, aggregate demand was stoked far beyond what was appropriate for achieving uh, the 2% inflation target. All right, so is it fair to say that the Bank of England is following a, a Keynesian model in approaching how they make policy decisions? Yes, broadly, but I think it's a fairly practical application of it. I mean, they, they don't rely um, to any significant degree on autonomous expenditure, which is the central notion of Keynesian economics, either in the area of uh, investment or government expenditure. Those are part of the construction of aggregate demand, but I, don't, I wouldn't say that they played an undue role uh, in the overall framework. It's, it's certainly not a pure Keynesian, but definitely not a monetarist framework. You claim in your article that the main driver of the surge in inflation in the last two years in the UK has been the creation of too much money by the Bank of England mm. via the asset purchase uh, uh, program or so-called quantitative easing. Yeah. Can you please uh, explain what QE is? Yeah. What, what's quantitative easing? Yes, so quantitative easing means the purchase on a large scale uh, of assets, usually government securities, but sometimes also private sector securities by the central bank. So in this case, we had the Bank of England buying large quantities of gilts. Now, an important feature of that was that they were buying those gilt-edged securities from non-banks. And you have to follow that through to figure what the result of that was. Imagine um, a, that, that the bank uses the old-fashioned method of writing a check, uh, and it, it writes a check to the seller of those securities. Now, the seller might be a money manager, might be an insurance company, a pension fund, or a, a sovereign wealth fund, or, or a variety of other players, but basically not a bank. So, so the seller receives a check Direct from the, directly from the Bank of England in payment, and he, she, or it, the institution, lodges that check with their bank, and their bank in turn seeks settlement from the Bank of England by passing the check back to the Bank of England for settlement. Mm -hmm. What the bank receives is additional reserves, and therefore it now has a, an asset that it didn't have before. But importantly, there are now new deposits in the banking system. That check from the Bank of England created money. It created new deposits. And that's the key element of quantitative easing. As uh, Governor Mervyn King said, actually in an IIMR, Institute for uh, International Monetary Research uh, lecture, um, QE is the creation of money by central banks although many central bankers are reluctant to say so. So there is a clear relation between asset purchases operations, or QE, and uh, changes in the amount of money in the economy. P 
provided that the purchases are from non-banks. Mm -hmm. If the purchase is from banks, which is the case with the, the ECB and the Bank of Japan, then the money creation process is, is much, much more limited. The problem in the last couple of years uh, is that uh, central bankers, they've claimed that uh, when they um, engaged in asset purchase operations back in the aftermath, during and in the aftermath of the global financial crisis years, that was not inflationary. So what changed this time? Why this time that increase in the amount of money has been inflationary? Yes, well, that's very interesting. After the global financial crisis, banks were in a very poor financial condition. In fact, many of them had large losses. Some in Britain had to be taken over uh, by the government, rescued. Um, others were instructed to raise capital. Um, and this was because most of the banks had large loan losses, which was eroding their capital. Uh, or they had large security losses from subprime and other types of securities of that sort that had lost value. So far from creating money in the normal sort of way, which is what commercial banks do, when they make loans, they essentially create new deposits. And normally banks account for the bulk of money creation. So in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, banks essentially step back from creating money and lending and were focused on repairing their balance sheets, raising capital, um, reducing their lending. And in fact, in this country and in the US, bank lending declined sharply. If that had been allowed to translate into the growth of deposits, on the other side of banks' balance sheets, there would have been an overall shrinkage in the quantity of money, just as happened in the Great Depression in the United States between 1931 and 1933. So this time, that is after the global financial crisis, <clears throat> the Bank of England and the Fed stepped in and by doing QE, they created money at a time when the banks were not creating money. And the reason it didn't create inflation was that essentially the central banks, the Bank of England and the Fed, were filling the hole that the commercial banks had left. And the net result was that the overall growth of money remained fairly subdued. It wasn't excessive. Generally, it remained in the sort of range of um, four to six, eight percent, something like that. Uh, for both countries. So the GFC episode of QE did not produce inflation because it didn't lead to excess money creation because of the way the banks were having to repair their balance sheets. Mm -hmm. um, in your article, you use uh, a different, a, 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 a significantly different theoretical framework to the one used by the Bank of England to assess and prescribe monetary policy decisions one that relies on the quantity theory of money. Uh, can you explain the main uh, propositions of the quantity theory of money, please? Yes, well, um, the quantity theory of money really has, um, I'd say for this purpose, two main components. Um, the first is that there is a fairly stable relationship between the quantity of money and the amount of spending in the economy. Uh, and by spending, I mean GDP in nominal or current terms. So that's GDP measured in current pounds or current dollars or current yen or whatever it is. And if you track the relationship between the quantity of money and the amount of spending, in the economy after economy, you will find that that relationship is very stable. Um, there's a slight difference um, because people tend to accumulate um, money as they get richer. As an economy grows, people tend to hold a little bit more money each year. So money tends to grow a little bit faster than spending. But 
to all intents and purposes, that's a very stable, well, it is a very stable relationship. It doesn't change very much. That's the first component, the stable relationship. The second is, <clears throat> and this is a logical deduction of the first, if you increase or decrease the quantity of money, the main effect is not on the amount of money that people hold, at least not in the longer run. In the short run, of course, the, the amount of money available changes. But in the longer run, and this is the important point, the main impact is not on either the amount of money they hold or the amount of real growth in the economy, but on the price level. So if you have too little money in the economy, the price level will tend to be squeezed and may go down. That's what we call deflation. Conversely, if you create too much money, most of the effect shows up uh, in the price level. And that would be a case of inflation. So those are the two main propositions for today's discussion. Perhaps it would be useful to clarify that when you refer to the amount of money, uh, you're talking about a broad definition of money, one including deposits, bank deposits. Yes, that's quite correct. Um, what matters for money is not simply either banknotes and coin uh, or uh, checking deposits, uh, which are used for transactions. But transactions money is only part of total money. A lot of money is used as, as a component of people's capital. Um, and so it, it's uh, advisable, it's, it's better to use uh, the total amount of currency in circulation plus all of the deposits in the banking system. And that's what we call a broad definition of money. In Britain, that would be M4, excluding some um, bank-like intermediaries money, but basically uh, an M4 concept. In the US, something like M2 or the old M3. Now that we know more about the, the quantity theory of money and the relation between the amount of money broadly defined and changes in prices over the medium to long term, how would you use this scheme, this framework, to, to, to make policy decisions? Right, well, let's shift from talking about the, the, the total quantity to the rate of change of these quantities. Um, what we find from research is that in all countries, the rate of growth of the quantity of money need, can be related closely to the rates of growth of the buildup of money balances, um, the real growth of the economy, and the inflation rate. So if you have an economy like, um, let's say, China 10, 15 years ago, when the economy was growing very rapidly, you need a faster rate of growth of money to accommodate higher real growth. But if we look at the UK today, uh, the figures are very different from the figures for China, say 10, 15, 20 years ago. What's needed for the UK today is a growth in the quantity of money that will satisfy, first of all, the annual increase in demand for money balances. That's the total money that we talked about just now. And that figure is about 1.3% per annum. Uh, we don't have to be too precise, but broadly, since 1997, uh, which is the period for which we have the appropriate definitions of money, 1.3% um, is good enough. <clears throat> Second, there is the growth rate of the economy. So if we take the, the growth of the UK economy um, over the past, over that period since 1997, it was a strong growth up until basically uh, the period after Brexit and COVID. Um, but if we, if we, so if we take the period up to um, 2019, uh, the growth rate of the economy was close to 2%. So for an ideal rate of growth of money, we need to have a growth rate which satisfies the increased demand, annual increase in demand for currency, 1.3%, plus the growth rate of the real economy, 2%, plus the inflation target, uh, which is now at 2%. So that's 5.3%, five five something like that. Now, I don't want to be too dogmatic about that number because over time, the growth rate may shift downwards. Arguably, it has shifted downwards. And 
the demand for money balances may change. But broadly, if the rate of growth of money was kept somewhere in the range, based on those numbers, 4 to 6%, and didn't sort of deviate down to zero, or up to 10 or 15% as we had during COVID, then broadly we would be in good shape to achieve, or Britain, the Bank of England would be in good shape to achieve the 2% inflation target. So following this, um, these reference values, uh, it wouldn't come as a surprise that uh, since we had a, a rate of growth of money at the peak of the pandemic of uh, 15% in the UK, yep. uh, you wouldn't be surprised that we, we are suffering from inflation in the last few months. No, that follows directly from the quantity theory of money. Um, we had um, a year and a half of, of growth, very rapid growth of money, and that translated you know, roughly two years later into so, inflation. So, of course, there is no, um, uh, there is not an immediate effect uh, resulting from changes in the amount of money. There is a delay. So the, the inflation that we are suffering from at the minute is caused by monetary policies. What happened to the amount of money two years ago? Or two years ago. Yes. The reason for the delay is that it takes time for people to adjust. They only kind of gradually adjust to the fact they have excess money balances, and then they're going to spend or dispose of those money balances gradually over time, not instantly. And that's why there's a, a long lag in effect. John, say that um, I have the mm. power to appoint you as a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. Uh, what would you, which changes, uh, changes in the monetary policy strategy would you implement uh, in order to, to secure uh, uh, a more stable currency over the mid to long term? Yes, well, I think it's important to say that a lot of the discussion would still be exactly the same around that table, uh, the Monetary Policy Committee, because you know, all of these, uh, all of the things they discuss are part of the transmission mechanism of um, monetary policy, except that they think of it, they tend to think of it as coming from interest rate changes alone and not changes in the quantity of money. So my priority would be to uh, focus, first of all, on what's happening to the quantity of money. Are we broadly within that range that I just mentioned, the sort of 4 to 6% range? If we're within that broad range, or it could be a little bit wider, but basically if, we were, if the uh, recent growth of money was within that range, there couldn't be too much deviation from the 2% inflation target. And then you could be more, a bit more sophisticated and uh, measure what had actually happened to money balances, the rate of change of money balances, because you have fairly up-to-date figures for GDP and you could project those with reasonable accuracy from the nominal GDP. And using those sorts of numbers, you could quickly um, assess you know, whether or not there was too much money or too little. And you could then implement policies which tended to move the money growth rate upwards or downwards. Um, in recent years, there have been several episodes before COVID. There were a couple of episodes when <clears throat> money growth was too low. Um, I think that if COVID hadn't occurred, we would have had a period of near deflation. Um, but conversely, as with COVID, during the COVID period, we had excess money growth. So the, the virtue of putting the money growth first is that it would act as a kind of override. And I believe that actually um, the letters that the governor writes to the, chance, to the chancellor if the inflation target uh, is missed, um, if, that is if it's outside of the range 1% to 3%, should also include as a mandatory item what is happening to the growth rate of money. Because including that would also focus attention on this question of how stable um, money growth needs to be for the long-term stability of inflation. So let's send on a positive note, uh, John. We know how to achieve uh, monetary stability and to preserve the purchasing power of the currency of the, of the medium to long term. We just need to have uh, 
different policies and a different framework implemented by the members of the Monetary Policy Committee. So thank you very much for joining us uh, today, John. It's been a, a pleasure to, to host you. I hope everyone enjoyed as much as I, as I did. If you want to know more about these topics, uh, you can access John Greenwood's uh, article on the Journal of Economic Affairs page online and on the Vincent Center's uh, website. Thank you all very much for listening. This podcast is edited by the Vincent Center at the University of Buckingham. You can visit our website at vincentcenter.com to access our podcast series and know more about the programs and events we host, both in Buckingham and in London. Please subscribe to our newsletter if you want to receive timely information on the Vincent Center's agenda.